Hey guys, it's John from Gexbot. I wanted to make a quick video about net convexity because we've been getting a lot of questions about it. So I'm just gonna start with uh, options profile, go through the what we call the convexity ladder, um, and that will take us right towards net convexity. Just as a reminder, a lot of this information is also in the resources tab under docs, um, but we'll go through some things, I guess, that, that, aren't, that aren't in there right now. Um, so the very beginning of net convexity is the options profile. The options profile takes a volume traded so far that day and classifies it as customer sold or bought. Customer bought is to the right and customer sold is to the left. Calls are in orange and puts are in purple. So we can see that we have a stack of long calls at 5840, a stack of customer short puts at 5735, uh, a stack of customer long puts at 5820, um, and a stack of short customer short calls at 5870. So for each of these options positions on the ladder, we can take the gamma exposure of that particular contract and aggregate it. So um, in the case of these 5870 calls, for instance, we know that they're customer short, so that means that it's um, customer short gamma. But they're also pretty far out of the money, and being far out of the money means that they don't have that much gamma to them. Oh, sorry. So if we were to then click on this gamma button, we can see, oh, there's basically nothing there. Um, that's because the gamma curve is kind of shaped like a bell curve, and it is the strongest near the money. And intuitively, that makes sense. Gamma is supposed to tell us the rate of change of the delta of a contract with movement in spot price. We're not going to get too deep into the math, but it's useful to know that at the money options have the highest gamma. Um, that's intuitive because if I'm buying a 50 delta or an at the money call or put, I would expect that um, because it's right at the juncture of being in versus out of the money, that as soon as it goes in the money, the delta goes up a lot in absolute value. As soon as it goes out of the money, the delta goes down a lot in absolute value. So. Um, it's the most sensitive, so to speak, to movements in spot. Um, so if we want to confirm that intuition, we can look at here There we have um, both customer long calls and customer long puts. There are more long puts than long calls. Um, so we should expect that the uh, 5835 strike is a customer long gamma strike. Um, and when we click here, we see that that is the case and that the largest uh, customer long gamma strike is 5840, um, which are these long calls up here. Now, as you may have noticed, the gamma ladder or the convexity ladder doesn't distinguish between puts and calls because the gamma of a put and a call at the same strike is actually the same. Um, it's just a way of understanding whether customers are long or short options weighted by their gamma uh, at each strike. The reason that we might be interested in something like that uh, is because it tells us whether um, customers are expecting an expansion in volatility uh, or a contraction, right? If I'm buying options, it's because I think that there is going to be more movement than whoever is pricing those options thinks there will be. Um, if I'm the, the easiest way to think about this is in terms of buying both a put and a call. Um, the, it's called the long straddle. The long straddle is going to outperform if there's more volatility uh, than is implied. So what we could say by looking at this profile is to say that customers are long options between 58.45 and 58.20 because they expect um, their long volatility in this range. And then their short volatility um, you know, b below 58.15, it's kind of hard to see given given how crazy this profile is today. Um, but but that's that's the concept, right? Where are people buying options? Where are they selling options? And um, we want to understand that buying and selling in terms of the sensitivity of those options to uh, changing their delta with movements and spot price because that is what is going to need to be hedged um, on those options. So let me just actually jump to a different ladder so you guys can see how a different one looks like. This is SPY today, um, which is the opposite of SPX, and this will be helpful context for understanding today's price action. But um, SPY is short short gamma 
basically everywhere. And so we would expect to see sold calls and sold puts on the options profile, which is exactly what we see, right? We see that there's this, um, there's systematically selling out of the money calls, selling out of the money puts. And we also see that the gamma profile is privileging the center of that distribution. Um, so that 582 is our max uh, short gamma. Um, typically when we see something like this, when we're seeing short gamma, we're basically seeing uh, participants that um, if they are exposed to very large movements are going to have to hedge because they're short options. Whereas if we see a profile with a lot of long gamma, like we see within SPX, um, we're seeing that participants are uh, relatively content with large moves. They want large moves. And so they're not going to react uh, aggressively or have to improvise uh, when we get really large ranges. Okay, so given that we have that understanding, let's move over to net convexity on SPX. All net convexity is, is summing all the bars on this ladder. So it's saying, if we were to add up um, all of our classified over order flow so far today, weighted according to its current gamma, right, currently current positions, then are we um, long or short gamma? Um, and that's our net convexity. So the reason that we call it net convexity is because if net convexity is positive, like it is today on SPX, um, it means that uh, SPX traders benefit from large moves in the underlying. Uh, if it's negative, it means that they do not benefit from large moves in the underlying. And you can see that it is very positive today, but it's quite negative for tomorrow. So another way to formulate that, instead of saying whether they benefit from large moves or not, is just to say that um, if net convexity is very negative, it means that participants are selling volatility. I'm actually so happy that this is happening right now because it'll be quite helpful to <laughs> explain um, uh, how, I, how I read net convexity. Anyway, sorry, to go back to what I was saying, um, if net convexity is very negative, it means that um, participants have been selling a lot of options. I like to think about and explain options selling as providing liquidity. Right? Because if somebody sells a put, they are saying, hey, I'm happy to buy at this price. Somebody sells a call, they're saying, hey, I'm happy to sell at this price. It means that participants are uh, providing a lot of liquidity to the market, which actually stifles, stifles movement, gets us those scenarios which are more likely to be putting a floor underneath the market and giving us sort of a gentle grind up that type of thing. Whereas if we have participants that are really long, can, um, that are really long volatility or long options, Sorry, I use some of these terms interchangeably um, because they are more or less interchangeable. Um, but if we see positive net convexity, what that's telling us is, hey, people are buying a lot of options because they expect a lot of movement and they don't want to be taking a lot of risk in this market. So in some ways, you could actually think about um, net convexity as your sort of zero DTE VIX, or in the case of Next um, on SPX, one DTE VIX, um, except it's a little bit more advanced than that, so to speak. So for instance, um, with net convexity rising all day today on SPX, I'm actually concerned, and that's why I was saying I wasn't surprised that we got this massive move here. Um, and I don't understand massive from the perspective of, okay, well, you know, it was only seven points, but how quickly it happened. Because I'm basically saying with, okay, net convexity is positive, there's not that much liquidity out there today relative to other days. Um, so I'm not surprised to see that we get these sorts of big whippy moves. In terms of why today's price action has been a little bit more stifled, um, I mean, we opened the day up around half a percent um, on SPX due to some news concerns that uh, over the weekend that didn't end up manifesting. And, um, but net convexity was rising as of 1030 in the morning. So on SPX, which is... Um, from a, the perspective of notional value, the most important ticker. So seeing that, I would say, okay, well, I'm not really interested. I don't think that they're, we're gonna get a trend day. Typically when we get uptrend days on SPX, they're marked by volatility selling as participants buy futures or other underlyings along with their option selling. So when I see that participants are buying options today, um, that net convexity is positive. Uh, I was thinking out of the gate, okay, um, it's unlikely that we're gonna continue to move up. It's interesting though, that we're getting so much volatility selling for tomorrow. Um, so that's actually giving me a scenario in which, well, we're not very likely to move up like crazy today, but also we do have a little bit of a floor underneath us. And another thing that could hint that that's the case is if we take a look at SPY, as we would expect, 
um, neck convexity on SPY is negative and has been trending negative all day, meaning that SPY participants, usually I, I would associate them with uh, smaller time traders, like more retail traders, that sort of thing. So sometimes they get it wrong, but in general, they have been selling volatility all day. And um, if we look at the current value of net convexity, it's around negative uh, 2000. Uh, this is in um, millions per percent move, so because it's just the aggregation of the latter. Um, and so then if we were to compare that with SPX, um, we'll see that it's not irrelevant, right? SPX is around 3.7 positive. So the fact that SPX for tomorrow is mostly selling volatility um, and we have a, a negative value of 1.6 and then we have SPY at around negative two. Uh, now, again, this is in thousands of millions, so billions, um, is sort of telling me that I'm getting a bit of a mixed picture as far as net convexity is concerned today. Um, now, SPY has a tendency to trade a little bit more directional. So um, like a very bullish setup on SPY would be actually positive net convexity, positive aggregate DEX. That'll be a different video. Um, but SPY participants have more of a tendency to buy options than SPX participants do. Um, so that's why I'm saying that when net convexity is positive on SPX, that tells me hmm, something is a little bit weird here. Um, we're likely to get either choppy price action or a move down. The one, the one exception to that would be days of with event volatility, like FOMC days, things like that. There we tend to see that SPX has positive net convexity and you have to rely on other things to um, figure out what direction we're likely to go. Um, because in general, traders tend to purchase options on those days, understandably. Hey, just a quick note from the editor here. If we are going into an event and net convexity is very, very positive and we don't end up selling off after the event, then all of those options that got bought, all of that lifting of implied volatility, all of that has to now come out of the market. And so that's actually potential energy that will be able to fuel us to the upside. So a lot of times if we see really um, positive readings in net convexity, it's telling us, it's giving us a warning sign, but at the same time, and markets seem to have a tendency to work this way, if nothing happens, all of that is part of our wall of worry or it's our fuel for the upside. So just another thing to keep in mind. And we have other metrics that um, work in tandem with this to help a little bit more in these instances. Um, but I just wanted to mention that in addition. I mean, this is very specific, right? It's we we have an event that convexity is really positive and we're holding in the 15 minutes, half hour after the event, something like that. Hopefully this makes sense. It's a relatively, um, how would I put it? Like these concepts are relatively simple. It's just that they're, they build on a lot of understanding, right? So you need to know what an option is. You need to know what gamma is. Then you need to understand that we're classifying volume intraday and then seeing the gamma exposure of that classified volume. Um, and then you need to understand that we are uh, aggregating or, or rather, sorry, summing the state of the ladder to get this metric. And that's actually how all of our net metrics work. Um, and so I personally use net convexity on SPX as my gauge of risk. Um, so today was telling me actually, okay, this is, there's a little bit of risk today. Um, and usually I'll combine SPX and SPY um, in order to do that. I'll take SPY with a grain of salt. I'll keep in mind the relative magnitude uh, of the one to the other. Um, but yeah, I mean, if net convexity stays up here and positive, like I will likely be fading the top of this range. Um, it's really interesting because 5835 has been a really big level all day. It's our major negative um, on the GEX profile, which is for another video. But um, you've seen every time we come up into 35, it's worth a fade. Um, and um, that's more or less what I've been doing all day since net convexity has been positive. Again, I haven't been expecting that the floor is gonna fall out from under us because of some of the things that I'm seeing elsewhere. Um, but it does give me some very useful context to understand, okay, um, there is not as much liquidity today as uh, on other days. Well, that's everything for this video. I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, good luck out there trading, and I'll be back soon with another one. Thanks for using Gexblog.